Hello. In today's lesson, I want to uh, revisit an incident that occurred in the ministry of Jesus Christ. The setting is Jesus is at the temple and he's teaching, and a crowd has gathered around him. Scribes and Pharisees show up, but they're not alone. They have a woman with them, and they caught her, according to their own words, quote, in the very act, end quote, of committing adultery. This is what this, where the story starts. And we read it in the 8th chapter of the book of John, the Gospel of John. Let's pick it up there. In John, 8th chapter, beginning in verse 1. And here's how it reads. But Jesus went up onto the Mount of Olives. And early in the morning he came into the temple. And all the people came unto him, and he sat down and taught them. And the scribes and Pharisees bring a woman taken in adultery, having set her in the midst. They say unto him, Teacher, this woman hath been taken in adultery in the very act. Now in the law of Moses commanded us to stone such. What then sayest thou of her? And this they said, trying him, that they might have whereof to accuse him. But Jesus stooped down and with his finger wrote on the ground. Well, let's stop there for just a moment. The Pharisees, the scribes and Pharisees, brought this adulterous woman to Jesus in the temple among all these people. I see them as witnesses, if you will. And they're trying Jesus, according to the Gospel of John. They're trying to see if he will enforce the law of Moses, which, of course, if he does, it would, it would demand that this woman be stoned to death as an adulteress. There's no getting around that. They want to see if this teacher, because he's so radical, they want to see if he's going to support or uphold the law of Moses. So now we find that Jesus stoops down, and for the first time, he writes something on the ground. He doesn't respond verbally. He writes something on the ground. The question is, what did he write on the ground? <clears throat> I believe I know what he wrote on the ground. I believe he wrote the commandment found in Leviticus chapter 20, verse 10. It's the commandment dealing with the punishment for adulterers. And here's how it reads, quote, And the man that committeth adultery with another man's wife even he that committeth adultery with his, with his neighbor's wife, the adulterer and the adulteress shall surely be put to death. So that, I believe, was what he wrote. And then the narrative in John continues. But when they continued asking him, he lifted up himself and said unto them, He that is without sin among you, let him cast the first stone at her. Not one man cast a stone at her. They stood there, but no one picked up a stone, and they were witnesses, and it required a witness to the very act to throw the first stone. Nobody throws a stone. Why? Because <laughs> they're all guilty of sin. The, the uh, commandment in Leviticus 20 is quite clear. You have to bring the man and the woman to justice. You have to punish them both. And the, it's rather obvious to me, if they caught the woman, and I quote in the very act, end quote, they caught the man. It wasn't secondhand uh, knowledge. Someone accused her. They caught him and her, but they didn't bring the man. That's their religious bias. It was the norm at that time, the prejudice, if you will. At this point, these religious pretenders remain. So Jesus writes on the ground a second time. And they're standing there, seemingly unconvicted of their sin. And it reads in chapter 8, verse 8, the book of John, and again he stooped down and with his finger wrote on the ground. Now the question comes up again. What did Jesus write on the ground a second time? I believe he wrote, as I mentioned a moment ago, the commandment in Leviticus 20 regarding taking the adulterer and adulteress uh, for punishment. I believe Jesus simply wrote a question, a very simple question on the ground. Where is the man? Question mark. If you caught the woman, remember, you caught the man. And with this, they were convicted. Here's how John uh, writes about it in verse 9. And they, when they heard it, went out one by one, beginning from the oldest, even unto the last. And Jesus was left alone and the woman, where she was in the midst. Now, Young's literal translation of verse 8 and 9 reads as follows. And again, having stooped down, he was writing on the ground. And they, having heard and by the conscience being convicted, were going forth one by one. So Young's literal translation, I think, points out 
why these men left. They didn't stone her. They stopped their accusations. They stopped any f motions of any kind to get her killed, convicted, if you will. And they walked away one by one. They were convicted. Jesus caught them in their religious bias. And then he turns to the woman. <clears throat> and Jesus lifted up himself and said unto her, Woman, where are they? Did no man condemn thee? What a great question. Where are your accusers? Of course, that was a rhetorical question. They're all gone. Jesus could see that. And she answered, No man, Lord. And Jesus said to her, Neither do I condemn thee. Go thy way. From henceforth, sin no more. Here's the real story behind the story, if you will, the hidden message that we find in the story of the adulterous woman. <clears throat> and it's hidden before our very eyes. The real story here isn't the fact that the men were biased against the women and bringing just her and not the man. That was pretty normative at that time. The real story of the adulterous woman is found in the way the men responded versus the way Jesus responds to the woman. The Pharisees and scribes demanded justice. Make a note of that word, justice. This is going to be very important to uncover in revealing the hidden message. They wanted Jesus to uphold Moses' law in, uh, about adultery, condemn the woman, and have her stoned. It was, in their eyes, the right thing to do, the just thing to do. They wanted justice. But Jesus responds in a completely different way. And in doing so, he reveals the hidden message in this particular encounter. Jesus has mercy on the woman. Note that word, mercy, because it's really a difference between justice and mercy. He replies to the woman, neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. The secret lesson lies in the difference between the meanings of the word justice and the meaning of the word mercy. And it's a potentially life-changing, powerful difference. Justice looks at our past. It looks at our past transgressions, sins, failures, etc. And it's always about our past. And this is exactly why the woman was standing before Jesus. She was guilty of adultery in her past. And the law required stoning her. That would have been just punishment under the law, justice. Mercy is different. Mercy isn't about the past. That's justice. Mercy is about the future. You might think of it this way. Justice was all about what was. But mercy is all about what may be if we become free to pursue a new and better life. That's what mercy is all about. It's about our future. Mercy frees us to pursue personal change, to mature, to become someone better, someone who's free to seek the best in this life without being weighed down by our past sins, transgressions, and failures. That's the foundational message of Jesus Christ, if you think about it. He has brought God's mercy to the world, despite the fact we all rightfully could be held accountable for our past sins. Mercy grants us a new chance, another chance, a new day. And Jesus offers mercy, a chance for all of us to pursue what may be if a person becomes free of their past. Think about the power behind that little word, mercy. Finally, the choice between justice and mercy, however, is ours. It's ours. Ours alone. We can choose to live in the past or seek a new, better future by accepting the mercy of of Jesus Christ, just as the adulterous woman did. Jesus freed her from her past. Her future was no longer controlling her. She was free. That's powerful. Free to become someone, something better, different, greater. Mercy is what makes that possibility in our lives. And that mercy is what we find when we come to Jesus Christ and express faith in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. The message of Christianity is a dynamic message. It's not a religious message. It's a life-changing message. And again, I say it's not a religious message. It's a spiritually life-changing message from Jesus Christ. I just pray everyone will embrace it and let go of the past. Let go of it. 
It's simply making you a prisoner and stopping you from reaching out into your future. Embrace the mercy of Jesus Christ and just wait to see how your life is going to change dynamically and how much better it's going to become. God bless you.